the, the, what I was asked to give, or the challenge was posed to me was, can you come and talk a little bit about food safety? To give food safety analysis, very broad, generic topic, which I think, well, it's interesting, it's good, but as I said, it's very challenging, a lot of information. So each one of the topics that we're going to touch today, we could develop a whole course in each one of them and talk during the whole day. Of course, we're not going to do that. At least I'm going to try not to do that. I speak fast and loud, so, but if you have any questions, I want this to be very laid back. If you have any questions or you concerns or comments, uh, please feel free to raise your hand and make a comment. This feedback helps us a lot and, and, and build our knowledge, experience, and our presentations. So we're going to give a general overview of food or pork safety. I'd like to start with a big picture. The idea here is we're going to go 30, 40,000 feet up in the air. We're going to get a big view of food safety. But to do that, we have to put this in context. It's, as I said, very broad. So the first thing you have to understand is, in my mind, I try to, as a scientist, try to organize things in, in topics or in boxes. When we look at this, we have to understand what are the main challenges that animal agriculture in general, whatever species you're talking about, swine, poultry, bovine, whatever it is, what are the main challenges that we are facing today? One, food security. We need or we must produce enough food for the whole world. There is a huge demand out there. We're going to see quickly something about it. There's a big demand, and we need to keep up with that demand. That's the first challenge that we have. Second, that food has to be safe for the consumer. So food safety, we need to produce a lot, but it has to be safe. But then you have other two relatively newer challenges, which are we have to produce all this food, this food in an ethic way. It needs to take into consideration the animal welfare and also the environmental impact. And all these things you may notice as we go through the presentation, uh, we have specific discussions that we've been uh, given presentations uh, about this, but today is not the goal, but you will see how these topics mostly touch each other. They interact with each other. There is no more. The systems are so complex nowadays that you cannot talk to each one of them individually. You eventually end up touching each other. On your, they, they, you do have to discuss interaction between them. Uh, when we look at the food security, the first challenge, <clears throat> we know there was plenty of data showing that between the 70s and 90s, we increased our productivity in about 50%. The demand increased, and we increased that productivity for about 50% to keep up with that demand. That's given. That's something that we know. However, there is a new challenge that we have ahead of us, which is the, from early 2000 to 2050, the United Nations put out reports and estimates. Originally, the report said we had to increase our uh, uh, food uh, uh, production in 70% to keep up with the demand. With the economical crisis, the global crisis, 2008, 9, it kind of slowed down. They pulled that back to 60, but it's between that 60 and 70%. That's most of the estimates go in that. The problem that is is... They only come up, they put a group of experts together, and they only came up with three options to do that. One of them is increased productivity with the space or the resources that we have or minimizing the use of additional resources, which implies in use of technology. <laughs> the second option will be increase the area of land that we use around the world to produce feed, grains for animals, for humans, for everything, plus the animals area needed. Or the third one, a combination of both of them. So as you can see, they have their, own, their own limitations, their, their issues. Some of them we're going to talk today. Well, what is that? We all know, and you've probably all seen this graph showing the evolution of the uh, human population in the world. By 2050, you probably heard this number, we're going to pass the 9 billion people in this world. Just because of that, it's a problem. But that's not the main issue. The issue here is, if you look at the dark park, dark part of the, the bars, this is the, the population of growth in developed countries. The light green or lime, whatever you want to call it, this is the evolution of the population in countries in development or the poor countries in the world. So that's a big issue. It's not the number of people that, are gonna, that we're going to have to feed, but the, what, which people we're going to have to feed. And that takes us to this graph. <clears throat> Ignore all these lines. The, the, the idea here, the goal is that the bars, uh, the same thing. This is the income growth expected over the next years until we reach 2050. The dark bar, also the, the light bar, the light green bar is developed countries. The green, dark green is countries in development. 
So not only the population is going to grow more, but their income is going to grow more. So what happens with that occurs? More money in their pocket, first thing they want to do, they start consuming. And particularly, they want high-quality protein. They want meat, eggs, whatever you want to call. Okay? So that is per se, it's already a huge challenge for the animal production in the whole world. <clears throat> when we look at the, what has been happening, we have been growing, and you can see the beef, pork, poultry industry, they are developing, they are just in the last, the past 10 years, this is what they've been developing and in production around the world, but it's still not enough to keep up with that. Another key thing to see here is one challenge for the specific for the pork industry is to keep up with the poultry industry. It's developing and it's expanding at a much faster pace than the pork industry. Uh, the pork industry has been, uh, the pork meat has been the most consumed and produced product since 79, but there are estimates that by 2020, poultry might be the first one. So that's another challenge specifically for the pork industry. Okay, but there are two more challenges. If you thought it was easy until now, there are two more challenges to make it a little bit harder. One is this graph here. This shows the proportion of farmers or families uh, uh, linked or uh, associated with farm or land or agriculture, whatever you want to call it. And you can see how it drastically dropped over the last century or more. And when you're today, we are below 2% of the population. It's somehow connected to agriculture, to farm, and things like that. And that's a problem because what? We are living a new challenge nowadays is what I call agricultural illiteracy. The population does not know anything about agriculture. And that's an issue. That's a problem, as you will see later in this presentation. The second challenge is this is what the population growth over the last few years but the problem here is 2012, if you cannot see it. And this is how we were able to keep up with the production. Breeding, green revolution, biotechnology. That was, those were tools that we used to keep up with that demand. Well, if you see, they're all based in technology. The problem is the current population of the world develops some, what we call technology rejection. That they don't, they're not accepting anymore technology. They're, they're, they're not, whatever they not, they not perceive as being natural, for them it's a cause of rejection. So that limits what kinds of tools that we can use in developing or keeping up with that demand. And that's very clear when you look at consumer surveys. Uh, recently in 2012 there was a consumer survey and what are the priorities of the consumers when they are consuming agricultural products, including animal products. And when we look at here, the top three, which make up more than 50%, more than half of, uh, of the consumers, the key things they want, as in case you can read here, I put a safe, affordable, nutritional food. That's what their top priority. That's what makes them decide. After that, you have a big chunk here, about 35%, that the second item is environment and welfare. So a product that is produced under ethical conditions, let's call it that way. And the last two, less than 10%, their concern or their, prior, their priority is affected by productivity or profitability of the producer. So that shows you quickly that there is a huge disconnect between the consumer and the reality. What I tell consumers when I talk to them is that if you don't have this, you're not going to get this. Okay, so you can't separate these two. It doesn't work that way. It's not that simple. And that's a big issue in nowadays in our market. Well, so when we talk about food safety specifically, and these issues that we are discussing, we talk about three main types of issues or hazards. One are the chemical hazards, contaminations, chemicals, even antibiotics, whatever, drugs you want to do, you want to consider here, physical hazards, needles or any other uh, uh, things that can be left uh, in the product, but these two are most often addressed by quality assurance prior, uh, initiatives or programs. The key thing here are the biological hazards. And why are the key things? It's not because they're more important or each one of them have a, their relative importance. The problem here is this is a much more complex issue. That's the problem. It's not as simple as something that you can detect. It's there, it's not. You can avoid, you cannot. This makes everything a little bit more nebulous, more complex, harder 
to touch, to understand, and you will see a little, some information about that. Within the biological hazards, we have two main categories that we have to address. One, pathogens, okay? And the second, now more, nowadays more and more important, antimicrobial resistance. It's another big issue that the population is consum it's concerned about. And these two are characterized essentially by being complex challenges and over the last few years, an increased focus on pre-harvest or in the farm, okay? And we may see some things that maybe make sense or not. When we talk, we talk specifically about biological or pathogens, we talk about these groups of pathogens. These are the main ones that we hear about all the time and whenever we're talking about pork. So we have the most traditional ones, bacterial pathogens, salmonella, campi, uh, listeria, yersinia. And then we have the parasites, uh, tinea, trichinella, toxoplasma. We're going to talk about them quickly later. And we have what we call emerging pathogens, things that we are newer, that we are listening about over the last few years. We're starting to listen more and more about. And they are essentially methicillin resistant staph aureus, which is the MRSA or MRSA. Well, the media loves this one. Uh, Clostridium difficile, hepatitis E virus, calicivirus, noroviruses. Okay? These three, as the name says, are viruses. We know very little about it, if anything. Uh, it's hard to work with virus, so I think that's why people kind of avoid working with these pathogens. It's not as easy as working with bacteria. So I think this is the next area that we need to expand our knowledge in virus. We, we don't know much about virology in the gut of these animals. And these two are gaining a lot of attention, but sometimes I have my questions if it's really a food safety issue or, or more a public health, occupational, and so forth issue. Uh, these are things that are being discussed. So when we look at this, the top priority usually uh, that we hear about is salmonella, how important it is. We hear a lot about salmonella. All of us not only hear about it or had an intimate encounter with salmonella in one of our stages of our lives. Everybody experienced an interaction with salmonella, knowingly or unknowingly, but we did. It's part of our life. But salmonella is very important from the standpoint of public health when we consider that it's the most important pathogen, a uh, foodborne pathogen causing hospitalizations. Okay? Uh, luckily, Death rate is very low, but it causes a lot of hospitalizations, and it's very much underreported. So we really, these numbers are estimates, are probably much higher than this, in fact. But how can we measure that? Nowadays, we measure everything in money, how much it costs. And a few years ago, a group from the Economic Research Service of the USDA they made a, they did some calculations and everything and estimated that in 1998, uh, salmonellosis caused about $2.3 billion losses due particularly to medical costs and productivity losses. And people say, well, well that's 1998. Well, if you think about how medical costs went up over the last decade or so and how much we are producing our productivity is increasing, I'll guess this number is much higher nowadays. So that shows us how important it is financially uh, for the government or for the country. More so is how challenging it is. These are the top three pathogens that have been the focus of everybody, Salmonella, Campylobacter, and E. coli 157, and data from the CDC and how it occurs in humans, the incidence per 100,000 uh, people. And you can see how E. coli kind of dropped and stabilized here. Uh, Campy had a big drop in the beginning, then pretty much stabilized. But Salmonella, we basically did not make any progress over the last decade or more. And years ago, the government of the CDC had established uh, healthy people goals by 2010. The goal was to have salmonella incidence at 6.8 per 100,000, Campy at 12.3, E. coli at 1. E. coli is pretty much close to that. Campylobacter uh, dropped, but as is relatively close, but salmonella, not even close, and we barely touch this pathogen. We're still struggling with it even years ago. How does it fit with pork? What's the role of pork on this? The role here is the following. Salmonella has been a top priority for the pork industry for the last years. I've been working with this uh, for a long time in pork, doing research in, in salmonella, and it's hard to 
really get specific attribution numbers, but it varies basically when you look at all the attributions that we see around the world, it usually varies between 5 and 30 percent. Okay? In U.S., the attributions are much lower. Usually they range between 6 and 9 percent. EU, the error attribution is much higher, 15 to 25 percent. This is a pool of different uh, estimates, so roughly the attribution may be between 5 and 30 percent. But what's the deal? What, what's the problem? The problem is the infected pigs, which we call carriers, these are most often animals that do not express any clinical symptoms. You cannot tell this pig from that pig if this one has salmonella and that one doesn't. They carry their salmonella, it's part of their microbiota, their gut microbiota, and do not express any clinical disease. Some occasions we have someone else's outbreaks in pigs, but they're not the most common. The most common problem, those pigs, if they get sick, most likely they will not get to the processing plant. What the problem is, these pigs they are healthy, they carry this pathogen, take it to the plant, and depending on the prevalence, the frequency, the number of animals in each group that, had, that is a carrier, or the levels of these pathogens in their gut, that's what determines the risk of contaminating the pork during the processing uh, of the plant. So the processing, the, the, the contamination occurs in the abattoirs or the processing, harvesting and processing line, but the infected pigs coming from the farm are the ones feeding that system. They keep bringing the salmonella in the gut every single day to the plant. Estimates in 1996 is that a single infected pig, uh, uh, when it gets to the harvest line, it is three to four times more likely to become an a contaminated carcass. Uh, if it's true or not, this is the only estimate on that. It's hard to do it, as I said, as you, it's hard to measure. But what, what, what's, the, what's the concern of the industry? The industry has been living in a very comfortable situation. The baseline established by the USDA years ago is 8.7%. Uh, but the industry, as you see, from 1998 all the way to 2011, has stayed well below this. This is pool of all sizes of plants and data from the USDA. So relatively comfortable, not a big issue as of now, but we know that the world is changing. All it takes, it's one outbreak, and then we have a mass in our hands. We know that. Nowadays, you can be with this, but you are not risk-free. What this means is it is there at a low level, but it is there. What happens if there is one outbreak and someone traces it back to pork, then we have a big mess in our hands. So we can't ignore this problem, even though from the regulatory standpoint, we are in good shape. But what, how, how does it look, the, the dynamics? What, what does the... Pig to pork, what I call, what is the dynamic of salmonella when we think in the, in the swine production systems? We have the farm where the pigs are, and then we have a split in transport, larage, or the resting pre-processing, and then the abattoir where we have the harvest and processing. What is interesting to see based, and I'll show you some data on this, and some studies that we've done, we've pretty much been... I'm saying that I've been stuck, my, my scientific career have been stuck in the limbo between the farm and the plant for years now, for over 10 years now. I've been working in this part of the production system. And what we have found is each one of these steps contributes to the salmonella prevalence and levels as these pigs get to the processing. So essentially what happens is your risk is low when you are at the farm, and as you move through the system, your risk keeps going up, and that's when you have the highest risk of contaminating your product. Some studies that we've done to demonstrate this show that, for example, simple management practices, uh, large barns where you're going to empty them to the processing, to transport these pigs for processing, uh, usually you don't empty them all at once. So it's very common practice to empty them what we call in pools or groups. And so we have usually the, some barns, it's just the first uh, pool, and then they close out, they take the half of the animals first, the largest animals first, so that gives the time and space for the feeders for the smaller animals to eat and catch up on that growth. And then two, three, four weeks later, they come back and, and remove the rest of the animals. Some uh, pro producers have three different groups, first pool, second second pool, and then close out, and so forth. So it's really rare in large production systems to have the whole barn being emptied at once. So we, went, we did a work on, on the field conditions, commercial conditions, and we went there and collected samples from the first pool of animals, fecal samples to monitor bacteriology, shedding of the salmonella, and serology to see antibody response. 
And then we went back four weeks later and collected from the close-out group, the last group, to compare. Is there an issue in there? What happens in that? And what we found it is in both cases, not only the frequency of salmonella statistically goes up about 9%, but also serologically, you have more pigs seroconverting, 30% of these pigs seroconvert, which means is that between the first and the close-out group, what happens, there is an active immune response, which means the pigs are being challenged with new salmonella. What causes that, we still don't know. Our, there are some high ideas or hypotheses. One of them is with a crew that comes in to select these animals and remove the first half of the animals, they may act actually to spread the salmonella because they have to go pen by pen and spread that salmonella around so you have more challenge. The second hypothesis will be that when you remove the largest pigs in the pen, pigs are highly social animals. So they start fighting or stressing themselves trying to figure out who is the leader of that pen again and that causes them to get stressed, more susceptible, infected or shed more uh, uh, salmonella. Follow another study that we did also under commercial conditions this one is actually funded by the National Pork Board. What we did is we sampled for four weeks finishing lots of pigs in a commercial farm. And the average prevalence was 4.5% at the farm. Then, right at the moment that we were transporting these pigs, we picked randomly 30 pigs from the positive pens to make sure we had positive and negative on this. We transported this in a completely washed, disinfected trailer. So we loaded, as we loaded these pigs, we collected fecal samples from these pigs again. And that prevalence went up to 11.3%. Then, when we transported these pigs for about an hour and a half and took them to the plant, as we were unloading these pigs in the packing plant for the larage area, we collected samples from the same pigs. That prevalence went up to 20%. Then, after two hours in the pre-processing pre resting or larage, we went back before they were moved to the processing line, collected samples. That prevalence went up to 42%. So it shows how each step contributes for that increase. Then we did a more controlled study where we want to say, okay, what happens if I have a pig with salmonella in their gut? So we challenge these pigs in the control conditions, and then I subject them to common stressors that we have in this gap between or this uh, limbo, let's say, between the farm and the plant. So what we did is we infected a group of pigs with controlled uh, salmonella strain, and we subjected them where a group was a control, no stress, and when they're pan with feed, water, everything. The second group was subjected to a feed withdrawal for 12 hours, like some farms do that. Then the, other, the third group was subjected for a two hours transport. And then the fourth group was a combination of feed withdrawal and transport. Then we collected, we sacrificed these animals and collected samples from the ileum, cecum, and rectum of these animals. The small and large intestine to see how much was being shed, and quantify the salmonella in these groups. So what we found is that in the ileum, the, the stress of feed withdrawal or feed withdrawal combined with transport was able to increase the concentration of salmonella in these pigs. Then when we, do, we look at the cecum, the feed withdrawal by itself kind of went up, but it wasn't statistically significant. Only the combination of feed withdrawal and transport was able to cause that, and in the rectum, nothing happened, which tells us that this, the type of stress is important and the region of the gut where you're talking about responds different to different types of stressors. But it shows how stress can potentially increase the risk for uh, uh, contaminations in the, the, of pork. Then we look at the opposite. I say, what happens if I stress these animals and then I expose them to salmonella? Will they pick up more salmonella? What happens with this? And so what we did is, again, we had four groups, a control, animals stay in their pan, feed, water, no problem, nothing to mix with them. Then we did to try a different type of stress that also occurs, particularly in larage. We mixed them with an unfamiliar pig. We brought in a pig that they never have, were exposed to each other and let them fight and establish their dominance for six hours. Then at one, uh, we'll transport for one hour, and then the combination of transport followed by mixing to mimic what happens in the real world, the packing plant. And then we expose them to a very low level of salmonella, and that's what we found, that as we put the stress on these animals, the control group had this level in the helium, the mixing, pick it up more salmonella, transport, pick it up the same amount of this and this, but when you combine the stress, they pick up more. They basically, we challenge these pigs with 10 to the fifth, so they pick it up most of the salmonella that we challenge these pigs. Uh, the sickle contents, uh, we had less effect following what we had in the previous study, and also this is the combination of a more, much uh, stronger stress, that's what led them to pick up significantly more salmonella. 
So with that, we see that pigs can be affected. The level of salmonella is affected and how those steps affect uh, the risk that we are doing, we are talking about. Well, as I said, we live in a comfortable situation. Market hogs, this is data from the USDA FSIS. Usually we're dealing on average between uh, 98 and 2011 of 3.6%, which puts us in a very good condition, but still, it's a risk. Is there, as I mentioned before, we cannot lower our guard on this. We need to keep an eye on this or we may be up for some trouble. Now, the second hazard, as I said, we have to touch on several topics. The second hazard we have from the biological standpoint is antimicrobial resistance. It's a much more complex issue, and these are the potential pathways that you will have between how food animals, uh, antimicrobial resistance from uh, food animals can reach the human. So it's not that easy. It's much more complex. We're dealing with uh, several different pathways. Uh, very difficult, and I think that's one of the reasons why we still don't understand much about it. Uh, honestly saying, as a scientist, we know very little about it. And so to simplify it a little bit so you don't have to memorize that pathway, I usually like to call attention for four main topics so it's easy for people to understand. What we're talking about is, first, residues, antimicrobials are used in animals, and then residues in, the, in these products consumed by humans, and then lower dose, cellular selecting or affecting or inducing resistance in the gut of the human population. This issue, what I tell people, this is the easy one. As long as you follow the drug labels and how they're used and everything, withdrawal periods and everything, you should not have that kind of problem. Okay? Those studies are done. Those companies, when they put those products out there, they test these things. They know the half-life of these products. So as long as you use them res responsibly, you should not have that type of problem. Okay, but that's the easy one. The problem that we have now is these two. We have resistant pathogens in the animals, as we say, for example, salmonella, that contaminates the food supply, and then it's ingested by humans, which in turn gets sick, and then we have problems treating these individuals because of a resistant strain. Okay? More than that, we can not only focus on pathogens. We have to understand that the gut microbiota, it's very complex. We're talking in pigs, easily 800 to 1,000 different species of bacteria in the gut of each one of these animals. So this is way more complex, and we, these, these microorganisms not only, uh, they're not pathogens most of the time, but they carry that resistance. They also contaminate the food supply, and they can share those genes or that resistance, and they can uh, contribute for the problems in humans. But then there's another route which is gaining more and more attention over the last couple of years, and I think it's going to get big uh, uh, coming forward, which is environmental contamination. What do we do at the farm with all the manure, all the stuff that we produce there? What happens? Where does all that go? All that, as I said, you just think in 800 to 1,000 species of bacteria in the gut of a single pig, you have thousands of pigs in a farm, where is all that manure going? So this is gaining a lot of strength. It's way more complicated than this. When we're talking this, we have a specific starting point and an end point. When we're talking about this, you don't have a beginning and end. You have a continuum of variables of issues and confoundings, which makes it much harder to pinpoint where it comes from, what is the, the region, what's the source, where is it going. <clears throat> so to monitor that, to account for that, feel free to interrupt me. Not that I'm going to stop, but feel free to interrupt me. Uh, to account for that, governments and institutions develop antimicrobial monitoring resistance, uh, resistant monitoring systems. And the USDA has, USDA, CDC, and FDA have that system. So I picked a couple of tables just to show you what is the status as we are doing an analysis. What is the status? Uh, when we look at multidrug resistant salmonella from swine, 1997 to 2010, the report, and you have all kinds of combinations, but I like to look at this number. If you look at this, you will see the same thing. But no resistance detected. So these are salmonella isolates from pigs, from swine, tested for antimicrobial resistance. Which, how many of these are susceptible? In 1997, we had 44.1% of those isolates were susceptible to all the antimicrobials tested. In 2010, 44.1%. So where is the problem? Look at the resistance specific here, and if you compare the first, most of these rows here and these boxes, you won't find much difference. So that's something that it's been calling my attention when you start looking at the real data. 
you look at salmonella in humans. These are percentage of salmonella isolates resistant to one or more antimicrobial classes in humans from 1996 to 2010. This is CDC data. This is what is happening. Where is it going? We look, let's look at another pathogen, one that is really important from the standpoint of antimicrobial resistance. It's a very uh, efficient carrier of antimicrobial resistance, Campylobacter. When we look at Campylobacter, same thing, no resistance detected. In 2001, 49.2%. .2%. In 2010, 47.3%. Not much of an increase there, no matter problem. So that's one of the things that I've been uh, arguing about. Do we have really a problem with antimicrobial resistance? Or are we blowing this thing out of proportion? People, I know I get a lot of pushbacks when I say that, but I said, if we look at the numbers, I don't see that. You know when you look and you start, I have some other studies that I've done, for example, starting to do some meta-analysis studies, and if you look at the number of papers published in specific time frames over time and on microbial resistance prevalence frequency, you do all combinations, how that number keeps going up. When you look at the media, more and more reports every day, are we really facing a problem or is this problem being set in our mind because of the volume of information or frequency that we're getting that. So we need to be very careful. We may have a problem, but from the numbers, I'm starting to be a little skeptical. I think we need to be a little bit more careful. We have a lot of science background, data available that we need to start looking with more attention to really make those decisions before we cause more damage. Well, another issue we talk about the biological hazards, the main issues, is alternative pork production systems. They're growing. We're hearing more and more about it, and their general assumption is happy pigs, safe pork. Is it? One of the main reasons why people are interested in this kind of products is exactly, oh, it's more nutritious, it's healthier, safer. I don't know. Let's take a quick look and look at what we know about it. When we talk about these production systems, essentially we're talking about key changes, housing and management practices. Okay? That's why I'm highlighting these two. These two because essentially when we think about disease, pathogens, we have to keep in mind this triangle. This is the basic epidemiological concept in, in infectious disease. We have the host, pathogen, and environment. And the disease, disease, disease sorry, results from these three-way interactions. So if we change these things, of course, we are changing how this triangle will be shaped in an, in an alternative production system. So the question is, what's the effect of the collagen epidemiology of pathogens? Do they change or not? Well, the problem when we talk about bacterial pathogens, the problem is looking at the data that we have nowadays is very limited. We have very limited data to make conclusions about it or definitive conclusions. Sometimes it's hard to have access to these systems. Researchers, as we are, uh, I used to joke, it's, uh, it's an, an animal in, in risk of being extinct. A lot of people are getting out of research because it's getting harder and harder to do research nowadays. But based on the few studies that have been published, we cannot come up with a clear pattern or difference. Oh, no, conventional has more pathogens than the other. You, you will see it both ways, depending on the study you're looking for. But we have to keep in mind that there are some things that we need to pay attention to. When we talk, I pulled two different studies that were doing, uh, they were co co comparing indoor and outdoor production systems. And it's not a matter, I don't care here about who, which one has more, because my point here is not, sometimes we have to look not only at the farm. What is being typical that we are finding a lot of these things is the carcass prevalence, the after processing prevalence, tends to be higher in most of the studies that I've seen where they did that kind of comparison. Again, just a few studies. So one thing that we have to be careful is not only think on the production system and the animal side, but we have to be careful where are these products being processed. So we know that the USDA has prevalence differentiations and the data that I presented in the beginning is all sizes because there are differences in the large processors and the small processors. So depending on where these animals. So far, a lot of these outdoors, alternative production systems, whatever you want to call it, they usually are processed in small plants. So usually you have a higher risk of contamination. They don't have so, so many sophisticated equipments or uh, uh, programs in place to control those contaminations. So they may not be a blame of the system, but in the processing. So that tells us we have to be careful when we make these kind of inferences on this. 
when we look, and I know you can barely see these numbers, the idea is not to describe these numbers, but the other thing, when we look at antimicrobial resistance data from outdoor and, and indoor, in both cases, uh, sometimes you cannot find a difference. And sometimes you will find, oftentimes actually, you will find resistance to a lot of antimicrobials in antimicrobial free production systems, which tells me that use of antimicrobials may not be the driving force or the only driving force in antimicrobial resistance problems. We have to start thinking about other potential issues. Where is all this resistance coming from if these animals were never subjected to an antimicrobial? What is, what's happening? It's an environment or not. We need to start being more careful when we do that kind of infrastructure discussions. Then we come to another point which is important, parasites. We moved pigs decades ago to indoor facilities, put them on concrete for a reason. Biosecurity, control pathogens, and particularly parasite cycles. Once you get these pigs out and you expose them to the soil, they have access to the soil, what happens? You start having problems again with parasites. And some of these parasites are very famous in pork around the world. We have to be very careful. Just a, a few examples, studies done in, in Europe, uh, they show clearly as you bring these pigs in indoor, pigs maintained exclusively indoor, pigs that had uh, extensive uh, indoor, but were raised extensive with some outdoor access, and pigs exclusive, excuse me, exclusively uh, raised outdoor, how the frequency of pathogen, of, of parasites increases. Then we have studies in the U.S., for example, for toxoplasma, another pathogen which is important. And we actually also see constantly the outdoor animals having higher frequency. So we have to be careful with this. Before they kick me out of here, uh, so what? Summarizing all this, what I tell people, in general, pork is safe compared to all other uh, uh, outbreaks that we had recent years in the U.S., uh, you rarely are going to hear about pork being a problem, particularly as long as the consumer, the retailers and consumer maintain this, don't abuse the product and, and cook it well, we should be fine. However, we should never expect food, particularly from animal region, to be risk-free. That just doesn't exist. There is always a risk. But just being alive is a risk. So we have to stop with that concept that there is no risk in life. And when we talk about complex systems like this, complexity equals risk of unintended consequence. The more you mess in the system, the more you may have unintended consequences. It becomes harder and harder to find those risks. So when we ask the question, does the pork industry have a problem? I said yes, but it's not what you're thinking about. It's not safety. The problem that we are having nowadays is where the information that the consumer gets comes from. We live in an era of a lot of information, and what I call the not the information era, the misinformation era. Speed of information nowadays generate a big problem. We do not. We usually just get information, absorb it quickly, just on the surface. We don't dig deep. We don't evaluate that information. Whatever is told to us, we accept it. The media knows how to sell, and they use those that, that, those channels and these things like superbugs, superbacteria, antibiotic apocalypse, factory farm. They use those terms to sell, to attract attention. You're not going to see, oh, beautiful swine farm selling magazine books or TV shows. So that's a big problem, and this is what has happened. The world is changing because of that. Science, based on facts and data, it's losing the consumer and their perception is getting more weight in our decisions. And that's complicating things and generating the unintended consequences that I was talking about. So key thing that we need to start thinking about, consumer education, it's critical. We need to work on this, otherwise I don't know where we are going. Uh, something like this calls my attention. A guy like this, extremely smart, never worked in a farm, and his business has nothing to do with farm with agriculture. A couple of years ago, he has, his foundation has a report every year when a guy like this puts out a report saying, given the central role that food plays in human welfare and national stability, it is shocking not to mention short-sighted and potentially dangerous, how little money is spent on agricultural research. That, to me, it's a big problem. That means if people that are not even related to agriculture are seeing that, it's because 
things are really, really bad. We need to be more careful about it. I would like to thank uh, my colleagues and, and at USDA, at Purdue, where we work, where we are based, uh, technicians, lots of students, of course, funding for the USDA National Park Board. If there are any questions, thanks for your attention.